have received uh, semi-strict instructions from the organizers that uh, each uh, panelist uh, should try to limit himself or herself to about 10 minutes. Uh, and of course, as the, uh, and, and the, we're going to follow the uh, order uh, in the uh, 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 program, except that I will be the last speaker and so if I'm a very bad uh, chairman and do not uh, keep track of the uh, time as residual claimant, uh, um, I will be penalized. Uh, the, uh, uh, I will not introduce the, uh, the speakers uh, for three reasons. First of all, to save time. Secondly, because they need no introduction. And also because the organizers have excellent uh, biographical uh, sketches uh, for each of the, uh, the panelists. So, uh, Joe, do you want to start? Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me just begin by, th uh, by uh, really praising the uh, team. I think it's a, intellectually uh, a real achievement. I think it, it really brings together uh, a whole set of uh, issues on, in the labor market uh, on jobs. An issue, obviously, that's a, a critical importance for developing countries, but also for developed countries. Uh, and uh, I only wish there were a, a comparable kind of, of report for focusing on the developed countries rather than the developing countries. I think they did the right job focusing on some of the distinctions between developing and developed countries. And now maybe this is, should be the inspiration for the OECD doing something similar. Uh, one of the reasons it's an achievement, I think it's an intellectual achievement, it's also a political achievement. And uh, uh, Martin emphasized that the WDR team is given a lot of independence, but while it's given a lot of independence, it's also put under a lot of political pressure uh, uh, that of one form or another. And an example of that, that I think probably uh, uh, helped shape some of the thinking uh, in putting this report together, uh, was uh, the report that was done a little over 10 years ago by Ravi uh, in the year uh, 2000 on, on poverty. And uh, what, is, what I find interesting is how some of the themes that were raised in that report have echoed in this report 12 years later um, what Ravi's report emphasized in the notion of poverty was that it went beyond income, income deprivation, to issues of insecurity and voice, and saying there are many more dimensions than just the, the uh, income dimension. And uh, 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 Ravi may have a chance to tell you how difficult uh, that was. In fact, he had to resign. Uh, so, uh, and there was a real attempt to suppress the report. In the end, the report uh, prevailed. And the ideas of the report have, have now gone more mainstream. But it, it was a, uh, a difficult uh, task. And um, the team needs to be commended that at least Martin didn't have to resign. And, uh, and that, not yet. And, and, <laughs> and he uh, managed to get, uh, get it through. Now, the uh, uh, challenge uh, going forward is to try to have the report influence what the bank does. Um, and influence the broader development community, and maybe that's some of the things that, that uh, can be discussed during the two-day meeting. Uh, part of the way in which that influence comes is actually from below as well as from above. That is to say, when the development community gets a, a sense of a, a perspective, I, I think it does have an effect on the bank. Um, you know, it's, the bank is a political institution that's sensitive to the environment that's going around, and I think that can have a, a, a big effect. An example of, of where it may already be having a, a debate and uh, an effect in conjunction with other political pressures is one of uh, the bank's uh, premier uh, flawed products. Uh, and that's the Doing Business Report. Um, and uh, as some of you know, uh, some people in the U.S. Congress have been pushing, uh, putting a lot of pressure uh, on the bank uh, and the fund not to rely on doing business. The IMF said that it will not rely, use the Doing Business Survey because it's so flawed. Um, and the bank, is, under Zellick, was reluctant to abandon uh, uh, or even to respond. Um, 
the critical, there are two critical mistakes in doing business. One of the parts had to do with the labor. And, and this really corrects in many ways uh, the mistakes of that. The other one is on taxation. <clears throat> well, I, I've been told I have very limited time, and so let me uh, uh, just raise about three very uh, brief remarks. The first uh, echoes uh, uh, the remarks that Ravi made in the beginning, uh, uh, is our jobs more than just the income generated by the jobs? Is labor different? And that really goes back to a, a debate, uh, to me, had a certain nostalgia, uh, because uh, when I first began development, uh, I was in uh, Kenya at the end of the 60s, in Gary Fields, and uh, that was an issue being debated uh, at that time. And um, uh, the, uh, I think we've come a long way since then to realize, and I think this report really makes it very clear, that uh, uh, the income generated does not really capture the development impact of uh, what we're talking about in jobs. And there are two aspects that are brought out. The first is that there are dynamic uh, aspects <laughs> Uh, of jobs, and this is the point of externalities, externalities both directly and labor, human capital spillovers, uh, but more directly, more indirectly through community, co social cohesion. And when, when uh, the chart where they talked about the three pillars, I would have had a lot more arrows going across uh, them and saying like, there are actually a lot of interactions. Social cohesion has effect on productivity uh, uh, and, and on well-being. Uh, and so it's, it's not just development. These are really much more interrelated. Um, and then the second point, uh, uh, and that maybe that Ravi didn't emphasize enough, uh, labor is different because the objective of development is increasing the well-being of people. Uh, and that's what bodies labor. So that uh, it is fundamentally different because it's what we're concerned about in development, enhancing the well-being of, of individuals. Um, and that well-being of individuals is, in fact, uh, is affected very much by employment, <coughs> whether it's self-employment or, or but it's having meaningful work, decent work. Uh, and uh, that was really, uh, the major message of the commission that I chaired, the Commission on the Measurement of Economic Performance and Social Progress, uh, that itself has had a, a, a very big influence in, in changing uh, uh, the notion of how we measure success, that GDP is not even, is not a good measure uh, of success. And uh, uh, there was, in the past, too much perspective of A, focusing on, on GDP as a good measure of success, and B, on the notion that if we could only get GDP up, there would be trickle-down economics. Trickle-down economics not only in terms of, of everybody benefiting, which we know is not true, but trickle-down economics in terms of job creation, and trickle-down economics in terms of well-being of individuals and society. So I think that this report uh, does a very good job of uh, highlighting um, that uh, uh, that process often doesn't work and that we need to think about uh, jobs in the world that they uh, affect well-being at the individual level and that the relation and a societal level and the interaction between the two. The second very brief comment uh, I uh, want to make has to do with uh, the point uh, highlighting again that not all jobs are equal. It's not just jobs, but uh, um, uh, the nature of the jobs and and uh, the employment relationship. And here, I think uh, they should be commended uh, for uh, referring to the decent work agenda uh, of the ILO. Um, and I hope we'll have a little dis uh, discussion later on on the issues of the ways in which there are some slight differences of views about what that decent work agenda uh, means. Uh, uh, I don't have time to talk about it given, given the limited uh, uh, time I have for my remarks, but 
I think uh, in the past, the World Bank has not interacted as much as it should have with the ILO and with other agencies and, and international agencies. And I think this was really uh, very uh, commendable. One, there are two aspects of this that I just want to highlight, again, very briefly. It's touched on uh, in the report, and I'm just really emphasizing or maybe emphasizing. One is uh, the importance of security, uh, social protection. Uh, security at the job level and social protection at the uh, national level. And uh, that uh, that can affect uh, the, uh, again, have macroeconomic consequences for the economy uh, and individual, uh, you know, what people care about are security. That was one of the things that was emphasized in, in, in the uh, uh, 2000 WDR. Uh, one aspect maybe that wasn't emphasized as much as I would have is uh, the notion of, and this is, doesn't apply to many developing countries, but, but, but certainly to some of the better, some of the uh, more uh, advanced uh, emerging markets, the notion of the, what's sometimes called the high quality labor market, high quality uh, uh, jobs, where um, uh, there's this interaction between voice participation, uh, uh, high wages, and a productive and productivity. So in these markets, labor market job satisfaction is high and job performance is high, and that there's a, 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 a positive synergy between the two. Uh, but even at lower down. Uh, Minimum wages have been criticized as being a labor market rigidity. But there is a literature going back, for instance, to Gavin Reich's uh, discussion of the role of the minimum wage in uh, the United States in transforming the U.S. South from a laggard, uh, inefficient, into a more dynamic. So we often think of these as rigidities that having a negative effect, whereas sometimes some of these regulatory actions uh, can uh, have a very positive transformative effect uh, on the economy. And uh, I think the historians would say that in the case of the U.S., the minimum wage per, uh, did exactly that, this. Um, the third issue I wanted to talk about just very briefly is uh, one of the things that was not discussed, and Martin gave an explanation of why, as much as I would have liked, is, is the old question that labor markets do begin, is why has there been a lack of job creation? Uh, uh, and again, this applies, you know, they gave a, a, a very strong view that uh, it's not just formal sector jobs, it's not just uh, um, uh, formal employment, but, but there's all kinds of, of self-employment, farm labor. But I want to talk about uh, uh, the fact that unemployment in many developing countries is still a problem. And this goes back maybe to uh, my being stuck in some of the problems that I first worked on uh, with Gary Fields in Kenya, where uh, urban unemployment was very visible and very large. And the question was, it seemed to be an equilibrium. Uh, it seemed to be persistent. And uh, the question was, uh, uh, what should be done about it? What the report does do a good job is dispensing with a lot of the shibboleths. It wasn't unions, the unions were Irre almost irrelevant. It wasn't even minimum wage because even to the extent they had a minimum wage, they weren't enforced. Um, it wasn't uh, rigidities that were exogenously uh, imposed. Um, what it uh, ha and and the what what uh, uh, my experience there, based on a lot of work that Gary Fields has done in his uh, PhD thesis was that it had something to do with efficiency, theory of efficiency wage. And that experience that then is, is really uh, uh, led, I think, to this very, uh, what, this, this literature. Okay. Um, oh, 
Okay, I, I talked too long already. Anyway, when, when Ravi saw me looking up in the, uh, 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 in, in the index, I hadn't seen anything about efficiency wage, and it's not in the index. And that was the uh, thing that I was concerned with. And there's a whole, whole set of issues uh, of that. Okay, let me just conclude with, with um, two uh, sentences. Uh, one, and maybe that will be picked up on by others. Uh, the first has to do with uh, uh, methodology. I thought this was a really rich uh, approach to trying to enhance our understanding of a critical issue. It used econometrics, case studies, uh, results of people who've used randomized experiments. Every, And I think uh, this is the way we make inferences about the world. I think the real danger in development has been uh, too much focus on a single methodology like random experiments. And I think this is a really a good illustration of how this can be brought uh, 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 together. The second was, um, as, uh, there were some remarks in it that uh, uh, touched certain uh, red buttons in, my, in myself that, that uh, I responded to in the current American political context. Uh, things like, um, uh, the private sector creates jobs. Um, uh, and I've heard that from other quarters. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's true, but so does the government. And in fact, uh, if you ask what was the basis of uh, a period of where the U.S. grew faster than it did in any other period and grew together, which were the decades after World War II, it was really based on government innovation, government investments in infrastructure, uh, uh, um, roads, uh, a whole a government GI Bill, uh, uh, government education. Uh, and so the pu public sector plays a very complementary, it's not a substitute, but a complementary role. And I, I would have liked to have had a, a more balanced uh, discussion. And there were some other things like that, and I understand the political difficulties which they <coughs> faced. And uh, I think uh, they managed them probably better than I would have done, because I would have been a little bit more combative. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very, very much. Uh, the, uh the last comment uh, of uh, Joe uh, reminds me of the editorial that appeared in the New York Times, I think it was three days ago, uh, on uh, the fundamental role of the government uh, in creating jobs. And in fact, they had uh, numbers which were very uh, exactly. impressive. Um, I, I forgot to mention at the outset that uh, I think all the panelists believe in equity. So uh, I, uh, I would very Sorry. much if we, no, 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 you did very well, and of course we, we owe it to you. Uh, but I would very much appreciate it if we could stay within our allocated time. So Professor Collins. Thank you. I'm, I'm wondering if I can, can I do the slides from here? It's sure. where you're more comfortable. This allows me to spread out a little bit as long as, as, long as people can hear me. Um, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. I was delighted to have the uh, excuse not to go to a lot of deaning meetings and to spend time thinking about some of the issues that are uh, raised here. There are actually a lot of issues that are on the table, and it was a real pleasure, I have to say, to um, go through at least parts of the study, and there's a lot in there. Um, I'm going to start as well in the same place that, uh, that my colleague Joe Stiglitz did and saying that I would really commend the team. Um, I found this to be an excellent report in a variety of different ways and um, what I want to do is to essentially try to highlight um, as part of, and let me, problem is I can't. Uh, see. So essentially what I would like to do is both to say a little bit about why um, I think the focus on, on jobs is particularly timely and important and valuable. Um, and then in my remarks what I'd like to do is to highlight what my takeaways were for their core messages, which are pretty similar to what's actually said in the report, but I'd like to frame them a little bit differently. And as I talk through them, I will try succinctly, but um, by putting some things down, it enables me to um, have some things up there that uh, I may not get to. Um, to highlight some areas where I would encourage or hope that those in this room and beyond will go further um, and some places where I think there's a somewhat different balance that I would have taken relative to the author's reports. But again, to second what uh, Joe just said, I think there 
most of the, just about every topic that I came up with, it's actually in there, and it's balanced, I think, quite thoughtfully. Uh, and so, in some ways, the uh, opportunity of a discussant is the opportunity to be a little bit more combative, et cetera. But I do want to say up front um, just how thoughtful and valuable this report is in a variety of ways. Um, two, so let me just say two things in particular. One is that how a topic is framed is really important. And the difference in framing to focus on jobs as opposed to, as Ravi put it, labor markets, employment, growth, that focus is really important. It's important in a variety of ways, and one of the key ones is it's much more multidimensional. It's multidimensional in terms of disciplinary perspectives. So there's not just going from labor economics to development economics, but also inherently in there, there's a sociology of the role that jobs play. There's an anthropology. There's a politics, political science. And so I think it's inherently more interdisciplinary uh, in, from that perspective. It also, I think, very nicely highlights a time frame kind of issue. And I'm, I'm probably going to go back and forth. So let me, let me keep going here. So. Uh, the focus on jobs is not just the traditional growth focus where, as Ravi has already mentioned, um, the, uh, there's a whole debate in literature on which types of growth are or aren't pro-poor. That's very much in the traditional World Bank kind of perspective on looking at these kinds of topics. If you decompose growth, of course, you can think that the growth in output per worker, I mean the growth in output, um, can be decomposed into the growth of employment and the growth of output per worker. And so in some ways you then get employment and you get productivity, and that's a much, much more standard frame to look at things. However, if you say jobs, and I actually asked a number of my colleagues at Michigan what they thought of a world development report entitled Jobs, and the most common reaction I got was surprise, because it's a much more individualistic focus then I think people often attribute to or think about coming from the World Bank. And I actually think that's really important because it broadens things out in a very different, intriguing way. Um, it does suggest that one can point to things that maybe aren't in the report, but everything can't be in the report. So I guess a key point that I'd like to make is that the framing of calling it jobs as opposed to calling it employment or a more aggregate kind of perspective I think is really important and changes some of the nature of the discussion. It also, I think, highlights the time frame differences because the growth framework is very much long term. And I am a huge proponent on the importance of long term persistence in terms of changing living standards. But at the same time, there's a huge immediacy of the jobs crisis. And so talking about jobs, I think, but both has a balance on the short term issues and the longer term perspectives, and I think that that's important as well. Um, and one of the things I also like about this is I think that it has a more research analytic component with all of the empirics, which uh, I'll come back to with the data, but it also has a very kind of practical hands-on component as well, and I think that Martin did a nice job of highlighting that in the things that he talked about. So um, lots and lots of, of things that uh, we could spend more time talking about. Um, two I'm going to come back to are the net versus um, gross jobs flow and uh, some of those other issues related to individual aspects. Um, he already talked about that framing of jobs being transformational in terms of connecting with living standards, productivity, and social cohesion. I agree, the, the arrows go in all different directions. On the other hand, the simplicity of the diagram is actually a nice framing. Um, so what are the core messages then? Um, one of them is the highlight on jobs. A second, and again, you've already heard this, but, but I just wanted to emphasize it, is sticking one's neck out to define what should be considered a job or not in, ter in terms of the decent job perspective, et cetera. And I, again, also wanted to highlight the importance of that. I think that it's, it's a conversation which is really important to have. Different people are going to stake out different points in that. But I think putting that front and center in this uh, context really is um, a, a very valuable thing. I also think that the explicit focus on the informal sector is really, really important. And I'll come back to that, although I have a feeling I will run out of time, so I may not have as much time to come back to it. Um, I think that's one of the huge, that's one of the number one issues in terms of the future agenda for data. 
Um, I think there's so much that we do not understand because we don't really know as much about what's going on in the informal sector in a lot of different places. Um, and, and we could have a long discussion about what the issues are there, uh, what kinds of things we might do to try to improve it. Um, th there are issues about the extent to which unpaid work is left out of a jobs agenda. Um, I do think that's an issue that's worth raising. I fully understand why the decision was made to define jobs the way that it was made. Um, at the same time, I wonder whether the social cohesion pillar doesn't provide a venue for incorporating in this framework um, more attention to the role that unpaid work plays which is really central to the things we care about in terms of living standards and development in, in uh, many different ways. And we've already heard about the idea that jobs have differential development impact, which of course means that part of the policy agenda is that you've got to then prioritize among them. And it seems to me, and I'm, I'm going to highlight one of the things that Joe talked about, it does seem to me that one of the balance uh, choices that the team made that I had questions about was what it says about the role of the public sector in the whole job creations piece. And I'm going to come back to that, but I have to say that I wondered as I thought about this whether part of that balance the team chose didn't come from the sense that if someone's supposed to be prioritizing among jobs, that could very quickly lead you to a place where the government had a very different set of roles than I think the authors wanted to come out with, and I agree with that. But I wonder whether that set of concerns might not have led them to understate what the positive and important role of the government public sector might be in jobs on the other side. And I'd like to come back to that. Ah, I've already talked for 12 minutes. So what I'm going to do <laughs> is go very quickly through. So I have the not one size fits all. That's really important. There are a lot of different pieces to that agenda, um, which uh, I, I will just say it seems to me that the whole issue of plateaus is not just about labor market policies. It comes out of the macro discussion of um, a growth agenda. It comes out of what the IMF said in terms of um, how you regulate financial markets. I think that that's in some ways the new normal, is the idea that there are plateaus and there are cliffs with thresholds. And what we should be thinking about from a policy perspective is where the thresholds are instead of thinking about linear relationships. Um, so I'm certainly not going to have time to talk about all of this. So I've already mentioned the private sector versus public sector. I think there's much more role for the public sector than uh, in positively making a difference. So um, there's a, a kind of best practice agenda which could be spelled out going forward. And, and I would encourage uh, more attention to some of those pieces. Um, I've mentioned the plateaus versus cliffs, which I think really is the new normal in terms of how we think about policy, that there are ranges of things that work, and it's not a one-size-fits-all, and what we want to look for is the thresholds. Um, I also wanted to highlight the focus on net versus gross flows, something that's really important in the international finance literature as well. They bring it out here, and it seems to me that there's a major set of additional uh, things to make there. Um, if you look at the net relative to destruction, so that's important for social cohesion. If you have an environment where there are different sets of approaches that could give you the same net with less destruction, um, we'd like to understand that better. And a lot of that has to do with data on informal markets. And I know that Eric is going to uh, be telling me that I'm really well after. Um, there's much more sets of issues related to the extent to which this job creation is zero versus positive sum. And so uh, there are issues there that I think uh, really should be on the agenda. And then the final place that I would end up with is the data needs. And there, the huge gaps are in the informal sector and also trying to understand the um, social cohesion better. And you get what you measure. And so to the extent that you start measuring things that aren't really the exact things that we want, it actually points people in perhaps problematic directions. And so how we select that data agenda, I think, is really important. So lots and lots of things that were stimulated, at least for me. And again, I'd like to end by commending the team. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Susan. And perhaps we'll have a chance to get back to some of the points during the uh, open discussion period that will follow the uh, panelists. Ravi? Okay, good. Well, as, as one of the organizers, I'm going to try and keep, uh, keep it short, uh, Eric. And since I also spoke this morning and raised some big picture questions, uh, I just want to pick up one point, just, just one point, and that is the fourth tweet 
which is informal is normal. Uh, and I think this is one of, one of the things the report does, is, as you mentioned, Susan, is emphasize uh, in, informality. In fact, I think it might well be called not just informal is normal, but informal is growing. <laughs> and that, I think, is one of the great stylized facts of the, current, of the current period, which I think leads us to an interesting, very interesting research agenda and a policy agenda. So if we define, I mean, there are all sorts of technical issues about defining uh, informality, et cetera, but if we roughly define it as activity that comes under the purview of state regulation, that's in fact how statistically we, uh, we define it and get the statistics from ILO and so on. Contrary to our stylized predictions, which we learn in basic development uh, economics, uh, informality far from declining has actually been increasing uh, in the last 20 years or so. In a range of countries, I mean, including, for example, India as a, as a, leading, as a, leading, a leading example. And the question is why? Why, despite, the, despite our expectations of, of, uh, uh, of our basic development economics courses, this informality is not declining? Uh, and I think that it's a very interesting research agenda. Could it be that the, that the regulations have become more lax? Uh, that's why we're measuring more informality. Could it be that the regulations are where they were, but enforcement has become more lax, which is why we're measuring more uh, informality? Or is it that, in some sense, technological and production conditions have changed? in such a way that the, that the regulations which define informality, now more activity is coming under the informal thing. So the standard one is, a standard measure of informality is, is uh, activities, uh, is enterprises which employ 10, 10 workers or less. Okay? So if technology, in fact, is evolving in a way that it's now more efficient to go to smaller scale, is that what's in, uh, explaining this, uh, the, these trends? Uh, my, my point is that we don't know. Uh, we don't know which of these things it is. And yet, this is a very important agenda. It's very important in policymakers' minds in India, for example, because they're, they're worried as hell, oh, informality is increasing. We have to do something. Uh, and they, they say, oh, we've got to formalize. We've got to do this or, or something. But we actually don't understand the nature of this, uh, of this evolution. And that's, my, that's really the, the main point that I want to make. And I want, also want to just link it to another major trend, which is urbanization. So another great stylized fact that we, that we uh, learn in basic development economics is that urbanization will proceed. Well, of these two great stylized facts, urbanization and formalization, urbanization is indeed proceeding, and formalization is not. Is there a link between the two? Is, there, is, is in fact, the fact that urbanization is proceeding apace related to the fact that informality is, not, uh, uh, is in fact, uh, increasing, not decreasing? And in some recent work that Ijaz Ghani and I have done, we've suggested that, in fact, there might well be a link, because as activities become, as, as, uh, as uh, agglomeration increases and as land rents rise, it may well be, uh, it may well be that the incentives for larger firms to move out of urban agglomerations and smaller firms to move in may well work in that, in that direction. And in fact, this is it, what, what's very interesting is in the last 20 years in India, for example, uh, uh, enterprises, uh, informal enterprises defined as being less than 10 workers, etc., are actually moving into urban areas. And formal enterprises defined as being more than 10 workers or more than 20 workers if they use electricity, that, that's, uh, using the technical definitions, are actually moving out of urban areas into what are officially classified as rural areas. Lots of measurement issues, lots of technical issues, but the question is, how do we explain this? How do we explain that the movement, the co-movement of urbanization on the one hand and non-formalization, in fact, increase of informality on the other? I think it's a very big, very big research question, uh, and I want to leave it, leave it at that. Thank you very much, and, and you deserve a gold star for <laughs> yielding a few of your minutes to the other panelists. Uh, Mr. Weiss. Thank you. Um, let me start by thanking the organizers for the invitation. It's a great, great privilege to be here and um, congratulating the team on the development of a, a truly fantastic report. I think, Martin, you said at the beginning, if, if part of your objective was to take the unhelpful heat out of the debate and to shine a light on, on where we can look um, to be more perhaps <laughs> pragmatic, um, when we can look at what works in terms of creating, yes, more jobs but better jobs, then I think you've removed a, removed a bunch of excuses and opened up space and uh, I think that's really, really helpful. Um, the, the first thing you'd notice about me is I'm, I'm not an economist by any description. I'm somebody that has uh, spent many years working with global garment companies, with trade unions, in global supply chains, uh, on the whole agenda of how you improve the quality of jobs while working with business, while working with competitiveness in a way that works and works sustainably. So to be, and, and spent many years arguing and building the case for, for jobs. So to be presented with a, 
400-odd page report and give them 10 minutes to report or to talk about it. You can understand if I feel like a child in a sweetie shop. Um, and, and Eric, you're my mother, standing there saying you can only pick one. So if, if the, the one I'm going to pick, the tweet I would pick, um, which I'll just spend a few minutes, I hope, building the case for, um, is I think there is a, you know, there's, an, there's an admirable description in this report of the case for core labor standards as the fundamentals and a description of the fundamentals. But there's a, an appearance, really, that they exist um, as a flaw. And I think that the report, if anything, undersells the power of rights if they're asserted in the right way, with the right regulation, et cetera, et cetera. I think you've got that right. The power of rights to act as a ladder to better quality jobs and jobs that are better for development and not just a flaw. And so let me just explain what I, what I mean by that. I should say that my experience comes um, in making these remarks from the implementation of a program called the Better Work Program. It's a partnership between the ILO and the IFC, which already makes us strange, I suppose. Um, and um, that program is about building competitiveness, competitiveness in the global garment industry, but also building, improving um, the application of, of, of labor laws and core labor standards in that industry. So working with the market in, in terms to, um, of strategies to improve application to labor rights. Um, and one of the things we do, um, given we're not labor economists, or most of us aren't, is we're in partnership with uh, academic institutions who rigorously assess the impact of what we do before, during, and after. We go into garment factories, we make an assessment of their compliance to labor law, we give them improvement plans, and then we give them a lot of intensive support in how to get there. So uh, let me make some comments, really, that really go to, to this point and talk to the theme of, of jobs being, or some jobs being better for development, and the, 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 the perspective that, um, that jobs drive to development, particularly those issues in the first three chapters of the report. So to the point on the relationship between better jobs and improved um, living standards, we do see a lot of evidence for this. The ILO has been working in Cambodia, as many of you know, um, the Better Factories program for over 10 years. Uh, there is, um, yeah, the development of that industry was based on the tying of quota to improvements in labor standards. And intensive support has been provided to that, those factories and indeed the state in ensuring in, in or in, in, in improving those, those standards come about. Now, our study showed that Cambodian households that include one garment worker earn 36% more than um, similar households that didn't include a garment worker. And when compared to five other major garment producing countries, the premium for that garment worker for that household was much higher. And one of the differences was that in Cambodia there was a mechanism to, in, to enforce and improve those rights and in the other countries they weren't. The importance of employment opportunities for women is, a, is an important theme in the report. Our research in Vietnam shows that women garment workers remit 25%, more than 25%, more than their male counterparts. Yes, it goes on food, it goes on debt repayment, it goes on clothes, but it also goes on investment of rural enterprise and of education of siblings and of women and girls. So there are development impacts of these jobs and spillovers beyond that, and that's clear. Um, what about the issue of, of productivity or competitiveness and how jobs um, relate to that? Well, I think the World Development Report notes that jobs in supply chains are often more productive uh, and provoke these knowledge spillovers. And we see in the garment industry there's this dynamic that the industry brings because of consumer pressure um, and a bunch of other factors, risk reputation management by, by major global brands, that there's this pressure to drive uh, labor standards up. And our program seeks to harness that. Now, we get regular report outs from our enterprise advisors in factories of the processes that managers who are initially resistant to this go through when they become champions or advocates for improving labor practice because they're seeing improvements in business, in, in, uh, business benefits from this. They see improvements in worker management communications, in worker loyalty, in the reduction of worker turnover, in the reduction of days lost to wildcat strikes, and a bunch of other benefits. And we're building a case here for, yes, rights, but how those improvements in job quality also benefit business and lead to an upskilling and an upgrading. So here's some examples. Again, in Cambodia, factories with a higher compliance to labor standards were the ones that were more likely to survive the financial crisis. Factories that joined the Better Work program in Vietnam 
after two years of being in our cycle are the ones that reported rise in sales, in, um, increase in employment, in productive capacity, in order size, and in longer and stronger relationships with their customers. Also in Vietnam, those factories in which workers, A, believed that they were paid according to promise, and B, did not complain that they were verbally harassed, those factories are more profitable than ones where workers did not cite those things. So I think there's, we're seeing a sufficient um, a body of evidence bubbling up to really enforce, uh, reinforce um, many of the, um, the core messages in the, in the report. I don't agree with them, but I think it builds this case that, it's, uh, that applied in the right way, that rights can also be a framework in which jobs that are good for development can become even better for development. And then I'd say on the, on the issue of social cohesion, um, the report notes that jobs are, are, good, that are good for development, positively influence values and contribute to a sense of fairness. It's been said that this is one of the rich parts of the report and I, I agree with that. Now we do surveys um, asking workers to rate their overall satisfaction with their current life on a basis of are you really satisfied or are you really not satisfied. Um, and this is work that we intend to get a lot more out of in the years to come, but we're beginning to get some interesting results. So one snippet from that is, is that workers reporting to be more satisfied are highly likely or more likely to express a trust in having a conversation or seeking support from a trade union organisation. And conversely, those workers reporting poor life satisfaction were the ones more likely to have the perception that discrimination in the place of work was preventing their progress or those of their colleagues. So I think those are just some of the experiences that we're building up from this data in over 700 factories around the world employing some um, quarter of a million workers. As I say, I think they, they support this, um, this notion that rights um, can be, can be um, we can push the envelope a bit further on the rights agenda than is included. And I'll just finish um, by maybe asking a few questions because I think the point of all this is what do we do with it? Um, and I think the report provides us with opportunities. So I think first on, 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 on questions to address, what are the opportunities to use worker rights um, and appropriate regulation to accelerate uh, the development impact of jobs is clearly one. I've said it about four times, so I'll say it again. I think um, the other is what does the bank or others plan to do in the area of work, of rights, of labour standards that's different to improve this and to improve social dialogue? Would there be scope for expanding the work on investment climate or in other areas? And lastly, I'd say, and I think the appeal was made at the beginning, I'll make references to all the uh, research I've cited, albeit too briefly, and circulate those. Most of them come from papers that have already been published. But if there is um, a willingness or an opportunity in the bank to work closer with the kind of learning that the Better Work Programme has developed, then we're more than willing to do that. Indeed, we're very excited to do so. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, and you'll get a silver star. <laughs> um, and I guess... Uh, My mother will be pleased, yeah. <laughs> well, we, uh, and, and of course we can come back to these issues uh, during the uh, uh, open session at the end. So uh, Jan okay, is uh, one of the uh, uh, organizers. Uh, uh, we are, of course, very curious to know what your comments will All right. be. Thank you, thank you. I'll, be, I'll try to be quick as well. <coughs> as you saw already what I said at the beginning, I really think this is a terrific report. So this is where Ravi and I had uh, very good expectations uh, and correctly fulfilled. Uh, so congratulations to the team. I think what's beautiful about it is that they use everything from taking the old ideas, going back to Arthur Lewis, you know, labor, uh, excess labor, low productivity, and what do you do with it, how do you go, the newer aspects, including the social benefits, social cohesion, and uh, the ideas of spillovers across uh, units, even across countries, and so on. What do you do both in the long term and uh, during large negative shocks? So in a way, this report really goes beyond a traditional report. So in a way, paradoxically, as I was reading it, I was sort of thinking, well, it would be great if they would go even beyond where they go in terms of their policy recommendations and, you know, go out on a limb, a little bit like the IMF is going out on a limb with Olivier Blanchard there and all that. But I understand you need to keep your job. So I, uh, uh, <laughs> that's why we did this conference in a way. No, just kidding. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, I, I fully sympathize with one wants to go beyond the standard model of derived demand and so on. But in a way, I would have um, 
appreciated, and I think in the discussion we can do that, is to think in terms of a model or conceptual framework, which can be based in economics or sociology, anthropology, whatever, that in some sense um, uh, tells us what we have in mind when we think about a particular policy or phenomenon. You know, as I was reading it, I said, oh, yeah, yeah, this sort of is like a derived demand, let's say, right? Here I thought, oh, this is a bargaining theory that they are using. You know, here they are clearly going after efficiency wages, but Joe was missing, but, you know, you are using it. Uh, cost of labor turnover model is there, you know, within it. The insider, outsider issues are, are dealt with. So, so in a way, you are relying on the richness of it. You all know it, and in some sense, you could have brought it out even more, I thought. And, uh, you know, there are the big issues like migration, which you describe and uh, analyze perfectly and uh, come on the side of bilateral migration agreements. But obviously, there are issues of insider-outsiders, because some people will be outsiders to those agreements, right? Do we care about them? Do we not care about them? What, what, is, what is the issue, right? Um, the private sector job creation, maybe not a red button, but uh, I certainly thought of, of it as, you know, would be nice to go more into it because some of the countries that you're using as an example, it was not just that the sector or existing firms created jobs, but firms were moved from state-owned to private. And I think that appears in the statistics as uh, private sector creating jobs, right? China, for instance, and others. But that would be nice to distinguish because those obviously from a policy standpoint are, are different things. Or the um, you know, vulnerability to economic downturn in the private sector labor market and you know, how do we adjust there. And I think that a uh, number of uh, situations indicate that to what extent we should adjust on the wage side rather than employment side. And in some sense it's beautiful you're focusing on jobs, maybe a little bit at the expense of wages. Uh, and we see a number of situations that workers prefer to have adjustment in wages if you keep the employment, the jobs, so to speak, uh, more abundant. And here I think, you know, one could go to the Vanek weitzman type models of, you know, adjusting, make, making labor more flexible on the income side and uh, less adjustment on the labor side. So I think that would have been certainly interesting. When you talk about the need to increase uh, wages because having work is not enough to reduce poverty, I think that's a very interesting insight. And immediately the question is, is investment in human capital enough? Or is it a question of labor share shrinking in the division between capital and labor? And to what extent do we see here and there? And what kind of policies would there be in terms of the implications of that? Um, I thought, like Susan, job creation, job destruction, and uh, all that is very interesting. I would even suggest there to look a little bit more into uh, to what extent it's jobs that are being destroyed, to what extent it's labor turnover. The same jobs stay, but different people fill them, right? And there, obviously, one wants to look at uh, are people moving from job to job, in which case it's not so bad, or are they moving from job to unemployment to job, possibly, or not? And so all that literature that many of us have been working on, the flows into, across different states uh, are, are very important in terms of the welfare implications of that. Um, same thing with entrepreneurship and churning of firms uh, versus thing. And then um, I think what was also interesting is you're talking about formalizing, right? The countries that are formalizing and they put premium on formal jobs, but at the same time you don't want to raise wages too much so jobs suffer, that employment suffers, right? What occurred to me just uh, uh, was Costa Rica being a really good model, right? In a way, not only being a good model in terms of Latin American context, but they provided a lot of the amenities to labor from healthcare and so on and so forth without placing it on wages and therefore uh, pricing labor out of competition. And uh, so, and I so thought, I was, I thought it, was, it was a really nice thing. Um, some jobs being unacceptable. I think that was very interesting, the human rights and all that. And um, the um, question just that arises there again and will be worth pursuing a little bit further, what happened to those who do not get the acceptable jobs? Are they in an unacceptable situation or acceptable, right? And, uh, and that's obviously a uh, you know, big issue that we have to do that. When you were talking sort of what are good jobs and how to approach that issue, I thought it was very good in the sense that you uh, have the various phases. The one of them that I had a little bit of trouble with is that the first phase is you check whether there are enough of them, of the good jobs. I haven't been to a country that would say yes. 
I mean, you <laughs> always have you know, never enough a good job. So, so a little bit more on how one actually handles that in practice would have been, you know, really, really good. And um, the idea of the plateau of policies that Susan mentioned is being used more and more. I think that's terrific. And again, one could go a little bit deeper in terms of the imperfections that are sort of causing uh, the plateau and the cliffs and so on and so forth. And here again, I think the, uh, th some of the theories that, that we have or conceptual frameworks are useful in the sense that, uh, you know, if it is too much power on the side of the uh, employer, so to speak, in those countries where that's, that's relevant, um, then giving labor a little bit more sight can actually not only offset but improve the outcome, right? Going from monopsony type situation to bilateral monopoly actually will be a superior outcome. So you can actually you know, improve on that. So an ending on uh, the data on jobs needed, I just couldn't sympathize more. As a person who works a lot with firm level data, it's uh, yeah, definitely something. Here I would just point out what somebody said earlier. Oh yeah, you did actually, Martin, about the ILO, then you take it over and so on. There is a distance theorem saying we trust the data that we are farthest from the most, <laughs> and that's a real problem. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, now is my turn, and I'll, I'll try to be consistent with my own uh, rules. So the, the first point I'd like to make uh, is uh, a, a historical one. If you look at the past, there are times uh, when the world economy goes through a phase of massive uh, downturn, standard of living going down everywhere. Uh, and at those times, as in the Great Depression starting in 1929, it was essential to re-examine the role of employment uh, as a way of getting out of the depression and, and uh, raising again the standard of living. Uh, this led to the, the Keynesian paradigm uh, and so on. The, the Great Recession beginning in uh, 2008 is another such event. It's of course not as uh, uh, serious, but it, uh, the, the massive rise in unemployment has forced us to uh, re-examine and look specifically at how uh, jobs can be uh, created. Uh, a third event that wasn't really generated by uh, a massive downturn in the world economy, but I'd like to mention, uh, and I happen to be part of it, was the, the World Employment Program of the ILO in the, uh, in the 1970s. Um, and, and again, human memory is very short. Um, there are very few references to the World Employment Program, and yet, it made some major contributions. It was, uh, in a way, a search for a new paradigm, and the new paradigm that was found was essentially the basic needs strategy, which later on was appropriated by the, uh, by the World Bank. So to some extent, the function, I think, of the uh, World Development Report might be, over time, to lead to a somewhat new paradigm I think we need a somewhat new paradigm that links jobs with development. So this leads me to uh, uh, the, uh, my, my more specific comments on the uh, uh, report. And the main causality that was followed in the report is from jobs to development. In fact, you have this uh, pyramid, which is very nice. The reverse link from the state of development and from initial conditions to the types of jobs required to accelerate development is not as much emphasized. And I would like to spend just a few minutes on that uh, link. The uh, um, methodology that was used was to develop a typology in terms of categories of countries, uh, agrarian, urbanizing, uh, uh, conflict, afflicted, resource, resource rich, uh, and so on. And given the prototypical conditions prevailing in those countries, uh, the report searched for the appropriate types of jobs needed to uh, accelerate development in those countries. Now, the 
what, what I found missing a little bit is, and what I would have liked to have seen developed further, uh, is a somewhat different mapping or an additional mapping looking at how the initial wealth distribution, how the initial income distribution, how the initial levels of poverty can either accelerate or retard growth. In other words, within each one of your categories, take the agrarian uh, countries, there must be some countries where the income distribution is significantly less even than in others, or where the initial poverty levels uh, tend to be much uh, higher. Uh, so uh, what I would have liked to have seen is a combination of the categories that were used together with another lens focusing on the initial income distribution poverty levels. Why is this important? Well, let me refer you to uh, uh, the, the modern approach to the political economy of development that uh, argues that uh, too high uh, an initial inequality in the income distribution can act as a drag on growth and thereby on uh, the creation of uh, future employment. Uh, Martin Revelian in a recent AER paper uh, uh, showed, I think conclusively, that the initial poverty level uh, in a country uh, can again be a major break to uh, uh, future growth uh, and thereby preclude the convergence that otherwise would have been uh, predicted. So um, the question I think that, that uh, I will leave is that uh, it's not just important to look at what would be a desirable pro-poor growth strategy, but perhaps as importantly, uh, what could be uh, a uh, um, pro-growth poverty reducing strategy. In other words, are there certain measures that by reducing poverty today can in a way reduce inequality and lead to uh, uh, greater growth in the, uh, in the future. Um, and I know I'm running out of time, but uh, clearly there are a number of uh, social protection schemes and uh, labor schemes that could be uh, redesigned, could be tailored to not only uh, invest in human capital in different ways, but also could perhaps uh, reduce poverty today and thereby contribute to uh, uh, growth in the future. Um, among those would be uh, uh, do more in terms of apprenticeship uh, and uh, uh, issues uh, like this. So we've come to the uh, uh, end of the uh, uh, panel time and it's, uh, I mean we're doing well, it's just after 12, so we have approximately half an hour for questions from the floor uh, and uh, uh, general discussion of the uh, of the report. Yes, please. My comments so I could be coherent and they're very brief. Um, I always like to say my name is Alice Labrie and I'm former U.S. Department of State Foreign Service uh, where I served under Richard Holbrook at the U.S. Mission to the UN. And where I learned my first posting... You need to speak uh, into the microphone. Sorry. Where I learned in my first posting that in Ankara, Turkey, that international relations are all based on trade and commerce. And even Andrew Carnegie says, you know, trade can um, prevent war. And I want to say that I appreciate, uh, as a Republican in Harlem, I commend Ms. Collins uh, where the name of the report, Jobs, it's, it's a non-elitist title for me. Now my comment, um, the importance of career training in junior and high school, we called it vocational training in my day. I came out with Greg shorthand and typing. And I didn't do so bad. And lastly, I just want to say commendations to our New York State Department of Education uh, regent, Dr. Merrill Tisch. I urge you all to Google her if you've not heard of her who's acknowledging this need and a need for new class content 
And my last comment regarding reducing poverty. If women could, uh, women employees could have the ability to control individual choice for how many children to have, it would greatly help the issue of poverty and the ability to work. So I want to say thank you all very much for this uh, open to the public forum. Thank you very much. Uh, um, Professor <clears throat> Ravi touched briefly on the impact of urbanization on jobs and possibly this uh, informal sector. Uh, you know, that's, and you suggested we you know, have to do a lot more analysis on this. Now, when we do this uh, more, you know, bring in all the statistics and start doing these kind of things, uh, would you suggest we also bring in the demographic boom, the tremendous you know, population and the effect on urbanization and these, these jobs there? I'll think, uh, we'll take a round of three and then I'll give a chance for the panel to respond one more and then we'll go to the next round. Uh, thank you. Um, just a, a question in terms of the, what bothered me is that there really is no definition of what success is here. I mean, when do we know that we've done well? And we're talking about decent jobs. We're talking about meaningful jobs. Now, this, you know, America, for example, was built on the backs of you know, people like my, my family that came over here and worked and never made over $5,000 a year. Now, you can say, well, that wasn't a decent job. That wasn't a meaningful job, but it was a job. And for many people arriving here, it's survival. So how do you define that? My parents... Uh, were success people who are poor, but they have a job, they have a self-esteem. The report doesn't define, except possibly in a, in a cultural way, what we think would be meaningful here at Columbia University, what we feel would be decent for our own children to have. But I feel that a job, the opportunity to have a job, can be a matter of survival. And if you start putting down certain kinds of jobs, the people who do those jobs won't work very hard. Thank you. Um, perhaps uh, the panelists might want, Susan, would you like to answer the first question? If you. Um, well, there's so, there's so many issues on, on the table, so uh, not sure actually which, so the comments. <laughs> Maybe I can, let me let me just try to pick up one theme, which is yeah. which is uh, the link between uh, education and jobs, and uh, uh, jobs understood more broadly, not just uh, narrowly. Uh, and one one of the issues clearly uh, being debated in the, in the United States, but uh, all over, is how do we structure our education system to facilitate. Uh, to, to make sure there's not a, job, a jobs mismatch between um, the demand and supply. And one aspect that uh, uh, some countries have emphasized, for instance, Ethiopia, uh, has been that, uh, really picking up on this theme, that, that uh, most of the education system has been oriented towards training people for formal urban sector jobs rather than increase productivity in the agrarian sector. And uh, maybe, maybe, maybe Martin should be up here to be able to comment a little bit about, about uh, how, how they view some of these issues. So. Yeah, thank you, Barry. Uh, the Ravi, there was a question on urbanization and the So let me, sector. yeah, I have two, two observations. One is, yeah, so this is an important, this is an important point. Uh, of course, the, the nature of the demographic transition in any country <laughs> basically provides a backdrop to any, any analysis of what's happening in that, in that country. So I think in that sense, uh, it's important. But I would say that, the, uh, that the, this, uh, this increase in informality is, uh, cuts across different categories of countries, some of which are through the demographic transition, some of which are not, et cetera. Of course, if, if you have a bulge, that's going to affect these numbers. Uh, but whether regulations are being enforced or not, uh, uh, whether regulation become laxer or not, whether technology is changing, I think that cuts across these different demographic uh, uh, transition areas. So that would be my one point. The second point, I think it is, uh, and perhaps Martin should respond to this point, of what is the definition uh, of success? Uh, I think that's, that's an, important, it's an important question. And I think it sort of relates back to, uh, back to Jan's point about uh, if we define an acceptable job, uh, if somebody doesn't get that, 
as a result of that, of a set of jobs being defined, this is this, uh, we're not going to take anything other than this. Those people, are they in, uh, unacceptable or what? And this then relates back to a point that I was making earlier, which is, uh, uh, this is the, the economist's DNA would, would naturally say, well, if we could loosen that criterion of acceptability, and some of the people who are now currently don't have the job now get it, isn't that, isn't that better overall? I mean, that, an economist is naturally drawn to that, to that sort of a position, but other perspectives are not, because you know, no matter what one says, slavery is not right, let's say, for example. Okay, then how does one address? I mean, in the extreme case, it's clear, but child labor it becomes start becoming less and less clear, uh, especially if one talks about less extreme forms of child. And that's where a lot of the debate does take place. So I think it would be interesting to hear from Martin's perspective how they, how they would answer that question. Um, I actually had wanted to weigh in on this last point, which I think is fundamental, and the, uh, the point being essentially, so what is the goal here? How do you know when you're successful, and how does that then come back to um, how you characterize and frame things? Um, that to me is related to the you get what you measure issue, because what you choose to measure and what you call it then matters in terms of how it's assessed. My point would be that I think one of the real uh, dimensions that's very commendable about this report is that it explicitly opens the door for that to be an important set of issues for discussion. And I think a lot of the traditional ways that economists often phrase these issues do not highlight that as a point. And so while one maybe can take issue with what points are or aren't made in the report or what things people on this panel choose to emphasize, it seems to me that the core point is that that set of issues is front and center once you frame jobs as being what we're talking about. And so I would actually say that I think we've moved further in this discussion to a more nuanced, interdisciplinary, multi-framed perspective on what matters, what doesn't, with these different contexts as opposed to one size fitting all that suggests that you might assess a particular um, job package in a different way depending on where countries are and depending on what else is going on. It, it, it seems to me that these are exactly what we should talk about and so I appreciate the, the uh, commentator raising the question. That's one of the things I commend the report for is opening that door. The, let me try my hand at answering the uh, question on uh, decent jobs and, and survival. Um, w when I first encountered the concept of uh, decent jobs, of course, I was all in favor of it, but it occurred to me that uh, in a number of instances, uh, individuals might not have much of a choice. Somebody em employed uh, as an informal uh, worker uh, may uh, uh, live under conditions that are not sanitary, it might even uh, have detrimental effects uh, on health over time. Uh, but if the uh, jobs are defined in such a way uh, as having to meet all of the conditions that prevail in richer, more developed uh, countries, uh, it would mean that some uh, households in really very poor countries would not be able to survive. So there's clearly, I think, a, a, a conflict there. And, and uh, um, it, it's, it's a little bit like child labor. There are many people who, uh, on principle, are against it. But clearly, uh, in a number of instances, uh, child labor is fundamental in increasing the uh, uh, household uh, income, of course. We cannot condone, we should outlaw uh, child prostitution and so on. But there are uh, certain jobs, factory jobs, that uh, could not be defined as decent that clearly uh, will reduce uh, poverty. So there's, there is a conflict there. Can we, I, we could maybe move to the second round of questions. Well, uh, thank you very much, Sam. And what you ended on is perfect for I was talking about some of these trade offs. I think it's great and very, very welcome that some of the kind of nasty trade-offs that were proposed by labor e economists and labor, uh, about wage levels and employment and so on and conditions and de that there's a trade-off between quality and quantity has been much exaggerated and the, and, and the WDR you know, clearly takes a position which is different from that and that's very welcome. Nonetheless, I wondered if the WDR or any of the panel 
would have an answer to the following dilemma which I faced, the question that I was asked uh, when I was working as the economic advisor um, to the government in Pakistan and Benazir Bhutto had just become prime minister. As of course as a woman prime minister of a, a society in which the discrimination against women was you know, extraordinarily high, she was very interested in issues of what to do and of course the observation of the women had very low labor force participation rates in Pakistan, much below average. Uh, and of course there's also great discrepancy in what women were paid, paid <coughs> in formal sector jobs. So, you know, she was concerned with both raising labor force participation rates of women as well as, you know, equal pay. And she asked me, what do we do? And, and of course I gave my kind of economist answer and I really didn't have an answer. Uh, I was torn and I said basically that I would not recommend a legislation minimum wage, raising that women's wages should be the same in one. Partly the reason I gave was a sort of cop out which is that it can't be really enforced and implemented. But the other was, you know, that there is a real trade off there. And the Prime Minister's reaction was, oh, you economists. <laughs> you know? And so there, are, there is a real trade off there of that, those kinds. There are other trade offs that you just referred to, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and, you know, where does one come out of some of these sort of nasty, painful trade offs? In, is, is worth, uh, much exaggerated and, and obviously there are a lot of things which are, the old days in which you just reduce wages in order to get more work is clearly you know, not something we need to be that drastic about, but there are some real issues. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, please. Uh, my name is Uyanga. I work in the United Nations Development Program, and um, by uh, we, my colleague and I, we took the opportunity of this wonderful conference being organized in New York to participate here. So thank you so much for the organizers, Cornell, Columbia, and the World Bank. So um, I wanted to make one informational comment and one personal question. Um, uh, as you probably know, the uh, with the deadline for the Millennium Development Goals in 2015, the United Nations family is starting um, wide-ranging consultations on many issues related to development, uh, uh, and growth and employment is one of them. Uh, in addition to the thematic or more technocratic consultations, we're starting consultations in uh, nearly 100 countries on the priorities for development. So I wanted to, to flag this. Um, Earlier this year, um, hosted in Japan, uh, we've organized a meeting of uh, experts and practitioners drawing from a wide range of countries to discuss the, um, what is the role of growth and employment in the new agenda. And it is really uh, amazing that there is a huge amount of convergence, if I may say, between the messages on this table and between uh, and those messages from the conference and with the conference being dominated more by the southern academics and practitioners. So I just wanted to invite um, in about, um, we, we'll, we have a website uh, called World We Want 2015, which is an official United Nations website for discussing online discussions and information. And in about two weeks, the page on the growth and employment will be opened there. So. We would like to invite um, everybody at this um, meeting to um, make comments, but also we will be putting the reports and video reports from the Tokyo conference and <coughs> are likely to invite, uh, organize an expert meeting uh, earlier next year in New York. So um, thank you very much. That was the informational comment. And the more personal question is about the role of structural transformation and employment. So. Um, I think there is a recognition, increasing recognition of the importance of structural transformation in developing countries for the growth, uh, for generation of jobs because we see huge um, uh, numbers of people by residual being concentrated in the informal sector in the slums of urban areas. So what is the take of the panel on the issue of structural transformation and industrial and agricultural policy? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Alfonso Diaz, no institutional affiliation. I think I should address this question to 
Well, Susan Collins, uh, and not just because this is the only lady, because but that, because uh, I, I remember centuries ago reading something. I'm not a very cultivated guy, so anyway, uh, uh, in the in a World Bank's uh, manual on inter on on the opening of the world of, of the world economy, or am I not? Am I wrong? Anyway, uh, it, because my question has to do with uh, the impact of. Uh, globalization and uh, more specifically of uh, the easing of uh, um, the uh, rules for investment, which uh, I think is, is uh, something that the report is still adhering to. That uh, maybe in the, in the full report there, there will be more nuances, but uh, from the presentation, uh, I got that idea that uh, the World Bank is still sticking to that idea that just uh, globalization and, and uh, opening up the, 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 the economy, the investment, the, the, the uh, foreign, uh, foreign investment uh, will create job without that uh, on the one hand and on the other hand, uh, Nuances that uh, have been rightly commended in, 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 uh, that uh, permeate the, the, the report, but it seems to me that uh, my question is specifically: Is there hard evidence uh, about the positive impact in both the number, the, 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 the number of, of jobs, but most importantly as well in the, the quality of jobs of opening up uh, the, the economies to foreign investment or? Is it related to the kind of, uh, of sectors? Um, I'm, I come from Colombia, and there has been a lot of foreign investment, but in, in mostly in the mining sector, which is widely known for being labor, not labor intensive, but capital intensive. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe one more, please. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my name is Marty Chen, and I want to also congratulate the team. But I wanted to pick up on something that Joe said and Ravi said, because um, I also share the red button issue, but in a slightly different way. I mean, in the US, yes, I ha take it the way Joe has talked about it. But in developing countries, I think seeing the private sector, which to many people means the private corporate sector, creates jobs, is misleading. Because in fact, most of them are being created by the private unincorporated um, sector, which is the informal. Um, so I wanted to say that. And the other is a point about urbanization and the growth of the informal and the role of the government. And what we find is, yes, industry, big industry is moving out and the informal is growing in cities. But what's happening also in cities, and it's really accelerated in the last two decades, is the cities are becoming very repressive of these urban livelihoods of the informal economy. So I think there's also a sort of do no harm principle that we have to bring in for government. It's not just government should support, but government should also do no harm. Thank you. Thank you very much. So who would like to start? Uh, Martin, uh, the, of course, Martin, you please uh, feel free to enter into uh, this dialogue at any time uh, we you want. Should, yeah, Martin, why don't you? Maybe Martin should talk at the end. Oh, OK. okay. Yeah, what, 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 after we yeah. go through everything. Yeah. Can I, can I let me make make a couple of comments uh, on a, a, a comments on a couple of the questions. One, I think the issue of uh, uh, what can uh, be done to uh, increase uh, participation rates, say, of, of women, uh, but of other, other uh, excluded groups, uh, is a very important one. And uh, there, I, uh, one of the comments I had been planning to make before I got uh, cut off was that uh, uh, actually I thought, and this is a question of nuance, I thought that there was a greater role for public policy uh, than at least some remarks in the report I, I sensed. And, and uh, there are several aspects of this. Um, you know, obviously they're complex, there are social attitudes, uh, the government can't legislate social attitudes. But I do think that um, 
uh, government public policy does affect norms and uh, uh, in the nature of the jobs created and, and, and at people's attitudes towards it. So for instance, in the case of the US, I think our civil rights legislation in the 60s really did change uh, over time the norms. And uh, uh, um, gender legislation is, uh, has a similar kind uh, of potential. So I would have taken a little bit stronger advocacy role that uh, on the role that, that government uh, can play in, in, in changing those norms. Secondly, it's not only the role of changing norms, but also facilitating, uh, particularly in the case of uh, uh, gender issues. Uh, again, maybe I'm thinking more about the advanced industrial countries, but we all, you know, we know the Scandinavian countries with their uh, uh, various programs that have facilitated uh, female labor force participation have made a uh, have made a difference both in terms of jobs and labor in, in labor markets, um, but uh, also in terms of uh, well-being, which is the issue that we are all uh, focused on. So, uh, it seems to me that that again uh, an important role for uh, uh, public uh, policy. Um, the. Uh, Third thing I guess I mentioned uh, is obviously re uh, related to uh, uh, in terms of, of um, skill uh, formation has to do with education and remarks that we've already uh, made. And the final point is a puzzle that maybe other people have a view on, which is illustrated by some of the, by, by the, looking at the chart that I thought was very interesting on migration, Im immigration, emigration, and, and, and if you put that in conjunction with unemployment, there are some countries where uh, there are high levels of unemployment and high levels of immigration. And the question is, what is going on? Uh, jobs are being created, but the jobs are being created are not being fulfilled, not being filled by people in the country. Uh, obvious example, we, we uh, uh, signed a free trade agreement with Jordan that led to a garment industry, but it didn't create many jobs for Jordanese. It was for Bangladesh. And why that happened is uh, 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 an interesting question. And, and that, that's a particularly serious problem a number of the uh, uh, rent-seeking economies, uh, the oil countries, where, where jobs are created, uh, but not for the people who are citizens uh, of the country. The other question I wanted to respond to a little bit was uh, uh, this really, uh, I had the same reaction that you had about whether easing the rules of foreign investment was a really uh, important, where that fit into a jobs agenda. Could it be a, a uh, and I would have not used easing, uh, but I would say uh, rethinking, because I think in some ways it may be, uh, or changing the rules of investment. Um, I think uh, the evidence is ambiguous uh, about the role that, that foreign companies often are more capital intensive, even in the same industry. So it's not just that they go into mining, but even the same industry, they bring in more capital intensive technology, and so they're job destroying. Uh, so I think that it's, it's more complicated than that. Uh, a particular example that is now being discussed in a number of countries, uh, South Africa, India, uh, have to do uh, with the role of uh, uh, retail sector. And it's not just that the uh, bringing in Walmart might lead to the destruction of the informal sector jobs, the small retailers that have been focused upon, but that Walmart could use its uh, um, uh, monopsony power to replace Indian or South African supply chain uh, with uh, uh, you might say uh, under uh, 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 low wage workers in those countries where it has monopsony power, um, there's a distribution question of where the jobs are created. And certainly countries like India and, and South Africa greatly ought to be concerned about that. Uh, but there are also question of replacing uh, 
jobs where a uh, monopsony firm squeezes workers uh, using those jobs and uh, uh, destroying jobs that might be better jobs. So in some, se in some sense, and certainly related to the domestic uh, economic uh, growth. Uh, Jan, can we go on? Uh, Ravi, can we go on for another five minutes? Yeah. Maybe? Yeah. Uh, the, there was a question on structural transformation. And, and here, I think the picture is very clear. Most uh, Asian countries had very successful structural transformation. The people uh, leaving agriculture found higher paying jobs outside of agriculture. So uh, the, the structural transformation wasn't the direction of increasing uh, income for all. Uh, in contrast, most of the sub-Saharan African countries had a flawed structural transformation in the sense that people were essentially pushed out of agriculture, ended up in the informal sector uh, at uh, incomes that were about the same, sometimes slightly higher than uh, the imputed income in agriculture. So uh, the, uh, you, here you have a real con contrast, and I was looking for, there is a, uh, a, a couple, there are a couple of figures here that are reproductions of uh, the uh, De Jean-Vrie Sadoulet World Development Report 2008. Uh, so Martin, if you want to respond or add to anything that has been said, you're welcome. It's, it's very difficult to do justice to so many comments and such rich comments, so I will not try to uh, touch on everything. But let me pick um, a few of the points and uh, do so uh, a bit in the, the spirit of what Susan said, which is that the way you frame the problem matters a lot. Um, and I think I sympathize fully with some of the comments that were made, even if they might have sounded a bit critical at times, uh, but they were framing reasons uh, to do this. And I think uh, they, they, there is a point that Dan made about trying to build consensus about an agenda that is so important and has proven so divisive. So some of the points we made that may seem simplified have uh, an objective, which is to bring everybody aboard. We don't, want, we don't want this to be a report to convince those who are already convinced. We want this a report to build consensus on something that we see as very urgent. Now, in this period of framing, let me take a few points and to give a response to each of them under the name of a country, because that will be a, a, an easy way uh, to, to, to make the point. Um, first, several of you emphasize that, well, private sector, private sector, there are so many public sector jobs that are important and so many ways in which the public sector is important. And we don't disagree at all about that. I think the nuance that Marty brought, that private sector in developing countries is not just corporations that self-employed are private sector, farmers are private sector. But in a way here, my answer will be Egypt, uh, in the sense that what we wanted to highlight was the risk of going in a direction where governments and governments have constituencies that can support that. Governments may want to fix employment problems through public sector employment and end up creating much more serious problems uh, in, in other places. Um, a second point that also Joe made was that we didn't emphasize unemployment enough and the fact that there is jobless growth or there isn't enough job creation or there is high employment. And we, we fully agree, but the, the point we wanted to make here, uh, my answer will be India uh, to, to this uh, point, is that over the medium to long term, uh, the unemployment rate is an integrated variable. It doesn't disappear, it doesn't explode. So over the long term, the growth uh, uh, of uh, employment more or less goes with the growth of the labor force. And what is, has been striking about India, India has a need to create something like 800,000 jobs net additional a month for like the next 15 years just to keep employment ratios const uh, constant. And it has been doing so. The problem is not that India has not been creating jobs. It's more that it has been creating things that uh, seem to be not in cities, not in modern sectors, and so on and so forth. And that, that was uh, what we uh, wanted to emphasize. Several of you, and Ravi in particular, mentioned informality. The informal is normal, but also the, the growth of 
informality. And there my answer will be Brazil. Um, what we wanted to, um, to point out by saying informal is normal is that there is a risk of trying to say let's formalize the labor market and that will be a solution. You try that in Mozambique, you try that in South Sudan where 7% uh, of the labor force is formal and half of it is in the public sector. So you make a big effort and you go from 7 to whatever, 9%. It's not sure that you will be doing a great service by focusing public policy, attention of public policy into doing that as opposed to uh, helping with uh, uh, real, em real uh, employment. And why do I say Brazil? It's because, yes, there are cases in, in our typology of job challenges. Um, we look at uh, uh, one of the challenges is formalizing countries, countries that are trying to uh, uh, close that gap, close that divide, many of them in Latin America. And Brazil has been a country that has been very successful at formalizing. Uh, there has been five or six percentage points of the labor force moving to formality. And it was not through watering down labor laws. It was through a very deliberate effort, a very deliberate focus on people who earn between one and two minimum wages, simplifying regulations, linking with uh, VAT and other parts of enforcement. Uh, so we, we were not saying informal is normal and we don't care. It's just let's be careful as to when that has, is a priority. Uh, and when it is not. Um, Jan and others had comments on approach. Uh, Jan said, um, of course, everybody will say there are not enough of these good jobs everywhere. Um, there my answer would be Pakistan. Um, we framed, it, we framed it the, the, that question in the decision tree in a bit of a technocratic way. What we wanted to say is, are incentives aligned? Are the social, is the social value of job commensurate with the private value of jobs? And there are cases in which it is not so. Uh, I think if you look at employment, women's employment in Pakistan, and you compare it with Vietnam, in Vietnam you will not say, oh, there is not enough uh, female employment, or women work, that, that's it. Uh, when you look at Pakistan, and it's 27% of women of working age in the labor force, then you can say, well, there is something less. Um, there, there is a shortage there. But what we wanted to do is, can you identify gaps between social and private value of jobs, which perhaps sounded a bit um, too technocratic. Um, on globalization, there were several questions on globalization, again, Joe, on, on cross-border investments. There, my answer will be Papua New Guinea. Uh, in our typology, we looked at a case like uh, in resource-rich countries, we did a study of Papua New Guinea. That's a case of globalization with all this mixed bag of, bag of things. There's one investment by Exxon, uh, which amounts to 240% of GDP as investment. Uh, and will create a thousand jobs when it's up and running. Uh, and in the meantime, Port Moresby is uh, the most expensive city in the world, the second city in terms of crime after Ciudad Juarez. So definitely we, we were not trying to make the case that just opening up to investment is what works and it can bring very serious trade-offs. And again, the question will be an empirical one. On the other hand, we have a lot of evidence that uh, there are spillovers from foreign-owned companies into the productivity of local companies. There's a lot of learning. Uh, and that what needs to be addressed is the point that Joe made precisely, that one reason why countries don't want to go into the liberalization of investment in services is because of these effects. And as long as we are not able to address their concerns in what kind of regulatory environment will prevent those downsides, uh, it's not necessarily uh, the silver bullet. Um, um, Eric raised the question on inequality. Um, um, there, uh, my answer will be South Africa. And let, let me try to explain a bit more why. We, we look quite a lot at inequality, areas of inequality. Uh, we found that it's a mixed bag. For instance, the, the work is very clear that around the world, labor shares of income are declining. And that's something uh, striking in itself. At the same time, working with this ILO October Inquiry database, what we found is that there is a greater convergence of earnings across some occupations. The more you go into skilled, occupations, the more you go into tradable occupations, the more global convergence there is. Now, the problem is that that reduces inequality in one direction, increases ine inequality in another direction, which is within the country, between the bricklayer and the chemical engineer, or whatever it is. Um, we also looked quite a lot at inequality of opportunity and how that the, the lack of fairness in, in access to jobs uh, can affect social cohesion. But why do I say South Africa's our, uh, my response on that point is that it's not necessarily inequality, it's not necessarily poverty. We use South Africa to understand why unemployment rates are so high in South Africa. And the 
standard response of labor economies is because of the industrial councils and the way collective bargaining is extended. And we ended up with an answer that was much more balanced, saying, well, there is a, uh, inheritance and, uh, something that was inherited from apartheid, which are these cities which are very functional in one part of the city, uh, but where a lot of people who need the jobs are living far from those jobs because there is this spatial divide. So there are issues of inequality that we highlighted, but they are not necessarily poverty. They can be opportunity. Uh, they can be fairness, and, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, Joe again raised uh, uh, another important point, which is skills and what we think about skills. And there my answer will be Bangladesh. I think what we, um, what we try to highlight in the report is that there are cases in which um, it's not necessarily the skills that will drive the jobs. Our chief economist, when we started this work, Justin Lin, told us, you know, education in China was the same before Deng Xiaoping and after Deng Xiaoping. It's not, it's not education, it's not skills that made the difference. And so we started looking more closely at this. And why do I say Bangladesh? Bangladesh was a hopeless case in development like 20 years ago, and I'm sure Marty will, could say something about Bangladesh many years ago uh, when, when she was there at the very beginning of, of, of independence. Um, and Bangladesh has succeeded in many ways, even in Millennium Development Goals. And we look at what happened there. And there were several issues related to skills which I think are, are, are very telling. One, a good story about globalization. The, the garment factories there are born from a Korean uh, factory that wanted to use the quotas of Bangladesh to, 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 to really enter with garments in, in, in industrial countries. Uh, decided to train 135 people in Korea to just get them in their company, and they were trained, and when they returned, they all left, and they started their own companies. And so uh, an entrepreneurial domestic class started through global integration. And then we see that cascading now. There is a study we cite in the report on how villages where a garment factory opens within commuting distance see the patterns of education of boys and girls to change. Families send their girls to schools because all of a sudden there is an employment opportunity. So these skills uh, driving jobs or jobs driving skills, we find it is more uh, complex than just going for vocational training and, and addressing mismatches. And I want to final, finally touch on how we define success. And here my answer is the world, not a single country. Um, we struggle with this. We struggle with this because we thought, well, if we take the social objective function as our measure, a social objective function is, by definition, shaped by societal values. We are not the ones who should be saying, what are those societal values? What way do you attribute to poverty reduction, to gender equality, to this or to that? But we found, well, there is something that is common, and that's rights. In a way, we started from a very practical point of view on rights. We say, we have no judgment on rights, but all countries in the world ratified the uh, Declaration on Human Rights. So that's a starting point. If we are saying it's societal values, here you have one that has been endorsed by everyone. So what are the implications of that one? And that, that's the foundation uh, that we wanted to use. But beyond that, it becomes very complicated. And why do I say the world as the answer? But because if you look at uh, the Millennium Development Goals, there is actually, in the Millennium Development Goals, there is a, a measure of success. Uh, and nobody knows about it. And the Millennium Development Goal 1, there is one indicator that is the working poor how many work in poor. But it's a very tricky indicator because that one can go down because the poor emerge out of poverty or it can go down because the poor don't have any work. So it, it's, it's very tricky. And when I'm saying the world, it's because we see if there are good data, if there is an agenda of data, if there is a good understanding, there is also an agenda of metrics on trying to see how we measure success. And maybe it's very different how we measure success in Pakistan and how we measure it in Papua New Guinea. So perhaps it's not our world, uh, a millennium, a post-millennium development goal. But we cannot advance in that direction without, I think, a database and a solid understanding. Thank you. So, so, so we've come to the end of this uh, session. And of course, I have to thank the, uh, the panelists. Uh, I have to thank Martin for his uh, very comprehensive response, and of course all of the uh, all of you uh, who asked uh, questions. Uh, do we resume at? Uh, we'll one? have David give us instructions. Yeah. Yes, <clears throat> there's lunch right outside. Um, you can eat out there, or you can bring the food back in here. We'll resume at 1:30. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.